Uh, join my colleagues in thanking uh, Chi Wang and the, and the U.S. China Policy uh, Foundation for uh, hosting this event. I think that the subject is important, uh, as is a lot of the activity uh, that, uh, that the foundation uh, sponsors. And so I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And as Richard said, we often all appear together, uh, at least uh, some of us in different configurations. Bonnie and I were on a panel yesterday. Uh, and uh, so uh, it's not quite a movable feast, but uh, anyway, it is a pleasure to be with uh, my colleagues. I'm going to talk about Beijing's uh, perspective and attitude. Uh, to some extent, I may uh, cover a couple of the topics that Richard talked about. Uh, on some of them, I'd actually like to have a, a discussion with Richard. Uh, I'm not going to do that at this point, uh, but there, there's a lot of uh, very uh, fertile ground to, uh, to go over. Since last fall, when Xi Jinping uh, became general secretary of the party and then also reiterated since he became uh, the head of state this spring, uh, Beijing's put a lot of emphasis on the continuity of policy toward Taiwan. In a fundamental sense, this has meant continued patience in making headway in cross-strait relations. But there's also been continued stress on the importance of continuing to advance the course of peaceful development of those relations. In other words, stability is good, stasis is not. The patience theme has evolved in recognition of both the overall view of the people in Taiwan, shown by several polls to be satisfied with the status quo but actively opposed to unification at this point, Number one, and number two, the political situation facing President Ma ying who has the flexibility to uh, move ahead, especially in cross-strait economic relations, but very little maneuvering room on the political uh, or security front. Now, for a while, uh, on the economic front, rumors were rife that with Xi's ascension, Beijing would uh, begin to press hard uh, for, no, I'm sorry, not on economic, I'll get to that. Beijing would press hard for political dialogue between authorities on both sides, and that penalties would be imposed, including in the economic area, uh, if Taipei resisted. But instead, at least as it looks to me, uh, Beijing seems to have settled, and I think quite realistically, on endorsement of track two, or what they call civil sector uh, dialogues, as a way to begin to create some level of political trust uh, and support for more formal uh, political dialogue later on. Uh, I note parenthetically that aspiring to trust is probably overly ambitious, establishing concrete goals such as transparency, perhaps confidence, predictability are, are more realistic. Moreover, the participants in these dialogues include more DPP people uh, than before. The PRC, of course, has been reaching out to all sorts of DPP members for some time, uh, including some senior ones. But the limits seem to have been stretched so that the only requirement now uh, is that the people involved not currently support Taiwan independence and that they have a, have, are in favor of improved cross-strait relations. Uh, even an embrace of one China is not necessary. On the other hand, despite the claims of some DPP officials to the contrary, the mainland is actually quite careful not to meet with any DPP official in his or her DPP capacity, and it will not meet on a party-to-party -party basis as long as the DPP has a Taiwan independence plank in its charter and does not embrace one China. Nonetheless, the current pattern certainly allows senior party officials from the DPP to have in-depth conversations uh, with mainland colleagues both on the mainland and in Taiwan. Uh, and even in uh, third countries. The issue of identity uh, is a focus of some of these efforts. And after some years of ignoring uh, resistance in Taiwan to being called Zhongren, or Chinese, in, because it, it seemed to have a political connotation uh, of belonging to one state, and that most obviously seemed to mean the PRC, Beijing has now focused in on a common identity of Zhonghua uh, Minzu, or the Chinese nation, or Chinese people. Uh, and indeed, the overwhelming majority of people in Taiwan, according to polls, uh, seem quite willing to accept this. What further identity uh, Beijing is pushing for in these dialogues, I haven't yet heard. And frankly, if any of you has, uh, I'd be interested. 
But a prominent participant in one set of these dialogues told me ahead of time that identity indeed was a priority uh, agenda item. Now, some PRC academics are quite prepared to say the purpose of all of this is to build a political foundation leading ultimately to unification. Officials also say this, obviously, especially in formal policy statements. But they and academics closely connected to the Taiwan Affairs Office are generally more careful these days to say that while the goal of ultimate unification, of course, has not changed, the purpose of these dialogues is not that, but to build political trust in order to contribute uh, to the peaceful development of cross-strait relations, Ping Fajian. In other words, they ask that people in Taiwan not fear entrapment in some sort of process that will send them down the slippery slope to a unification that pretty much everyone acknowledges they don't want at this point. Whereas many PRC academics in the past have debated fiercely among themselves about whether she would bide his time for the first couple of years and then adopt a hard line toward Taiwan, most have abandoned this line of thinking. In this connection, it's interesting to note that uh, Taiwan's former National Security Council, Secretary General Su Qi, uh, who traveled to Beijing uh, with KMT Honorary Chairman Wu Boxiong in June, as Bonnie mentioned, returned with a strong view reaffirming Xi's patience. He quoted Xi as speaking of understanding the need for time to heal the wounds of the past and to stop the pain. Now, that does, does that mean that Taiwan can relax and it doesn't need uh, sufficient military capability to deter and, if necessary, defend, at least for a time, against the use of coercion or actual military force? No, of course not. And indeed, from a mainland perspective, the PLA cannot afford to totally let down its guard or give up the capability to hold any Taiwan independence tendencies in check, that they have not even been able to bring themselves to pull back short-range missiles opposite Taiwan, a gesture that would be militarily almost meaningless, potentially, though, of some political importance. But their failure to be able to do that, doubtless, is the manifestation of various factors uh, coming together. But one thing is clear, and that is that Beijing does not have confidence that without that element of coercion in the background, Taiwan can be trusted not to move away from unification. So from Beijing's perspective, until the day of unification, the PLA will need to maintain the capability to deter and, if necessary, defeat Taiwan independence, however minuscule the chance of that may now be. Even with that cap capability on the part of the PLA, there's concern in the mainland about possible movement, as Richard indicated, toward peaceful separation. That is, a situation in which the people in Taiwan, frustrated as they may be with their ambiguous diplomatic status, simply opt to live with the current situation and seek to make it more or less permanent as the least worst cho uh, choice. Can you hand me my uh, water bottle? Thank you. Now, active consideration of that possibility of peaceful separation is not called for at this point, at least in my judgment as Beijing retains sufficient confidence uh, that uh, things will ultimately move in its direction, that is, ultimately toward unification. So it doesn't need to contemplate permanent separation as long as there's no active movement toward Taiwan independence and as long as the government in Taipei accepts some form of a one-China framework. Now that raises the interesting question of what will happen in 2016 and indeed in the campaign leading up to the 2016 presidential election uh, in Taiwan, if it appears the DPP might regain power, but has not adopted a one-China approach in its own platform. One has to assume the PRC's efforts to reach out to the DPP at this point are designed to lay a foundation for enticing the DPP to change its policy by reducing the sense of threat and emphasizing the mutual benefit that can be obtained from a closer relationship across the strait. A crucial part of that enticement, of course, is the benefit Taiwan obtains from cross-strait economic relations. There was a time some months ago, as the transition from Hu Jintao to Xi Jinping was in process, that some observers thought they caught hints of a growing demand from Beijing for strict reciprocity in economic agreements. 
As many of you know, the Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement signed in mid-2010 contained a list of so-called early harvest items for which tariffs would be sharply reduced in the near term. And the weight of benefits was clearly in Taiwan's favor. Now, if this were to change, the implications could be significant. But the reality is that while there is indeed some greater push from the mainland for broader access to certain sectors of Taiwan's markets, particularly, for example, in finance, part of the reaffirmed policy is that agreements will continue to be of special benefit to the people in Taiwan, especially people in central and southern Taiwan, especially small and medium enterprises and farmers and fishermen. All of this, of course, is part of the overall Hearts and Minds campaign, but it's a part that touches directly on pocketbooks in Taiwan, which Beijing sees as having particular effect. The mainland's not ignoring larger economic interests either, of course, and as we saw toward the end of the 2012 presidential campaign, Beijing sent a clear signal through some major business leaders on the island that given the DPP's failure to change its mainland policy, if the DPP came into office, there was a significant possibility, not only that new cross-strait agreements would not be reached, but that the implementation of existing agreements, which, as Richard suggested, not all are impl being implemented smoothly anyway, could become even more ragged. So what we see is a combined short, medium, and long-term campaign from the mainland to woo people in Taiwan. In the process, there's considerable stress on the concept that people on both sides of the strait are part of the same family, a concept that former Premier Wen Jiabao also stressed when he was in office. The implication, both as articulated by Wen and now, is that members of the same family do a lot for each other. But if there is no family relationship, then the impetus to do, so, uh, to do these favors would be significantly reduced. Other aspects of the PRC's agenda for the coming two or three years include not only ramping up educational, cultural, and S&T exchanges, but signing umbrella agreements in these areas. Whether all of these initiatives for agreement will prosper or not, and there's resistance to one or more of them for various, from various quarters in Taiwan, from Beijing's perspective, the point, as with pretty much everything else, is to forge a thick web of relationships that can both stabilize and deepen cross-strait relations and a sense of common cause to rejuvenate the Chinese nation. Three final points. First, Beijing has sought to enlist Taipei in common cause on East and South China Sea issues, jointly defending Chinese sovereignty and economic interests. Though Beijing has been quite frustrated by Taiwan's lack of interest in any such collaboration, it undoubtedly has not given up hope that a future situation will change the view on the island. Indeed, Beijing perceived some support uh, for at least parallel approaches in the recent problems between Taiwan and the Philippines, but this was scotched by the Ma administration's successful efforts to resolve the issue with Manila. Beijing's disappointment was on public view as one PRC scholar, for example, went on national television to voice his regret at the resolution of the matter, saying it deprived Beijing of the opportunity to forge a common front with Taipei. Second point, while Beijing, as a matter of principle, dismisses the legitimacy of any US role in cross-strait relations, and is particularly concerned about continuing security ties between Washington and Taipei, especially arms sales, it did conclude in the Chen Shui Bian era that the United States does not support Taiwan independence, and that was a fundamentally important conclusion. But they're not yet convinced about is that the United States would truly, as it says it would, support any outcome that the two sides arrive at peacefully and without coercion, even implicitly unification, or that the US would support steps leading in that direction. The mainland continues to argue, of course, that Taiwan is the most important and most sensitive issue in US PRC relations. And I don't disagree with that in the sense that if things went in a wrong direction in cross-strait relations, and the US were seen either to be sponsoring or abetting this development, it would have a profoundly negative effect on Sino-American bilateral ties, all the other important things we do together notwithstanding. In the extreme, and even keeping in mind the sensitivity of the Senkaku-Jiayu issue, 
Taiwan is, in my view, the only issue that I can see any prospect of the United States and China coming to blows over. Obviously, that isn't a likely prospect. But the greater concern is that Beijing perceives the US as guiding tai Taiwan away from closer ties with the mainland. And Chinese colleagues relate conversations with their Taiwan counterparts who report that the US is warning Taiwan against going too far. It isn't true, but in any case, I can't tell you what the impact of this is on PRC policies towards Taiwan. But I do think some recent developments in the area of international space that Bonnie discussed suggest a perception of US interference, as she said, may complicate PRC efforts to reach accommodation with Taipei, reinforcing the views of those who argue that Beijing should not dance to Washington's tune. My final point has to do with Mang Zhou's recently expressed interest, both in attending the APEC leaders meeting and having a meeting with Xi Jinping. I'll leave to others or to the Q&A discussion uh, to talk about what Ma is doing and why he's doing it. But from a PRC perspective, I would note that Beijing is apparently dividing these issues into compartments, one for APEC and one for a Xi Ma meeting. On the former, APEC, Beijing has emphasized the need, as Bonnie said, to follow protocols established in APEC and the relevant memorandum of understanding. What we, one needs to note, of course, is that these rules were established by Beijing to exclude Taiwan's president from attending. So the prospects look dim, although I guess I would say that the statement issued by the foreign ministry yesterday in Beijing about this subject contained a certain amount of ambiguity, not a lot, but at least worth noting. And on a Xi Ma meeting, PRC officials have said this would be a good thing, but the proper conditions need to be established by both sides. What that means precisely, and whether Ma would have the flexibility to meet the PRC's conditions, and they to meet his, remains to be seen. And I would note that he has emphasized the importance of maintaining dig dignity, uh, something that you don't hear the PRC talking about uh, as much as they talk about dealing on an equal basis, whatever that means to them. The likelihood is that such a meeting between the two leaders will not happen, and especially so if it's separated from some other international event such as APEC. But this is a situation where I would suggest one should never say never, and I'm sure that Taipei is not giving up on this. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much.